So I'll be talking about caching today. Um, mostly a lot about conceptual concepts around caching, uh, but I'll touch on things like um, those little APIs that you use within your WordPress plugins and themes to implement caching uh, in your code. Uh, if you are here looking for recommendations on what caching plugins to use, I will not talk about that. It's not the goal of this talk. This, this, this talk the goal, the idea about this talk is more to um, teach you guys about what caching is and how it actually you can put the different pieces of caching together to get build a better site. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm from Toronto, Ontario. So there's a lot of um, I'm a code wrangler at WordPress.com BAP. Um, I basically, uh, which is sorry, the uh, team at Automatic. Um, we're the team that basically works with really large scale sites um, like Time, CNN, TechCrunch, um, really big scale WordPress installations. Um, we basically help them with do things like scale their sites. Um, a lot of that, a lot of my work involves doing things like code reviews, um, doing a lot of answering WordPress questions, and a lot of the work that I do day to day involves um, caching because caching is an essential part of actually scaling WordPress. I often contribute to core, most patches in there, I've worked on a bunch of plugins, and I'm also an Alright, just a little shout out to Automatic, we're hiring tons of people. If you find at the end of the talk that everything was really boring because you knew everything, chances are you're a good fit to work at Automatic. Come talk to me after and I'll show you how that works. So, jumping straight in, what is caching? So caching is basically more than just installing a plugin to fix your uptime problems. Right? The, the, most, the, the basic concept that most people have of caching is, hey, I'll install this plugin and all my problems go away. Well, there's a lot more to it than that. Caching as a concept is basically storing data temporarily somewhere so it can access them. Right. Um, basically, it's a way to prevent having to do expensive computation over and over again. Right. So that can involve anything from things like fetching stuff from the database, right, making a row call. So for example, you know, if you're interacting with the Twitter API or the Facebook API, sort of external API, your website has to interact with that. You know, that can be an expensive process, and caching sort of help us alleviate some of that expensiveness. Um, the, the idea is that basically you put some, you know, some data or some information somewhere nearby so that you don't have to do those hops over and over again, right? And then you can cache all sorts of things and any type of data that you want to, right? We'll get to the types of data that WordPress caches and all sort of stuff a little bit later. So a good analogy that I like to use, um, this actually is the first time I'm trying it out, but it's, you know, that sort of helps people sort of understand what caching is all about, right? So imagine if you are, have a log cabin, right, down in the woods, right, and you have an old time fireplace, right? So my parents actually have one of those really fancy fireplaces where you flick a switch and all of a sudden it's fire. Imagine you have one that you actually would require actual wood. The problem with the wood thing is that you actually need to go out and either buy the wood or the force and chop it down yourself. Right? Um, so, you know, if you want to start a fire, what do you have to do? You have to go to the forest, chop some wood, bring it back, add it to the fire, and start the fire. Boom, done. The problem is, every time you need to start the fire, you have to go to the forest every single time. How can we alleviate that process? Right? Um, the way what we can do is basically create a pile of wood. That pile of wood is a cache. So the idea is that you go to forest, instead of chopping down one tree, you chop down ten trees. And bring that, those ten trees and that chopped pile of wood back to your, close to your cabin, and put it together in a pile, so that the next time you want to start a fire, instead of having to go to the forest to chop those trees down, you just go to the cache, right? go to the pile and grab the wood that you need. Obviously, that, that some, when the wood empties out, you need to go back to the forest again. But we basically saved us ten trips, so instead of having to go ten times to the forest, we just went ten, ten times to the pile, uh, the pile of wood. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that clear? So, who cares, right? What does it all mean? Well, this is a quote that people like to often bring up from Google. It's basically, high performance websites lead to higher visitor engagement, retention, and conversions. Right? Basically, fast sites includes money. Right? Um, basically, if you have a fast site, people are going to come to your site and enjoy your site. Right? Um, on the flip side, Basically, a slow page means that it's a profit killer, right? People are, are going to come to your site if they're waiting around for seconds at a time for anything to happen, right? Even for that initial page load, if they have to wait for three seconds, four seconds, five seconds, ten seconds, they're not going to wait around. They're going to, leave, right? they're going to find your competitor. They're going to find another different site that you know has a similar content or data that they're looking for. They're going to go there instead, right? And it's inevitable, right? As your site grows, as your traffic grows, things slow down. And it's something that your users, like I said, you know, they want, right? And they've become used to it, right? If you look at your interactions with Facebook or any sort of modern web applications, you do something and 
in brief response immediately, right? When you're typing or when you're looking up a friend on you know your Facebook search, right? You type one letter, boom, there's like ten search results all of a sudden, right? If you take that analogy and put it on your site, right? Does your search behave that way, right? If you type, one, if you go to your website search, you type one letter, does anything happen? No, right? Users are starting to expect really fast interactions, right? And then your sites basically have to be responding just as fast as well. So our goal is to basically cut down the page load as much as possible. And the page load basically is a good way to refer to this two different types of page loads, right? One page load is basically a server level page load, right? So how long the server takes to generate a page and send it to the browser, right? So that's a server side page load time. And there's obviously client side page load time. We're not gonna touch about, worry about the client side page load stuff right? today. Right? We're gonna focus entirely on the page load time. This is a graph from a VIP site, uh, gigelm.com, right? Basically shows you average uh, page load time from across their site, right? How long on average it takes you to generate a page, right? When you visit gigelm.com, right? The Y axis is the actual of seconds, and the, the x-axis is the basically the time period, right? So you can see, like you know, early in the graph, it's very spiky. It's kind of unpredictable, right? Jumping all over the place. Sometimes it's 1.5 seconds. Sometimes it's two seconds. Sometimes it's you know, 2.5. 2.5 is terrible. If you have a site that's slow, you're, you should be off the internet. People are not going to stick around uh, for that long. Um, but basically, then you see all of a sudden that around January 7, huge drop. And now it's something that's pretty consistent. You know, there's a little spike in the middle, but you know, it's consistent there. Basically, the, that, was, that was the point where they redesigned their site, right? And one of the main goals of that redesign was basically how can we optimize our site as much as possible, right? How can we make sure that performance is a key component of our website? Like before, you know, they just kept packing on features after features after features and functionality after functionality. But come to the redesign, they basically were like, you know, how can we optimize as much as possible? So performance was one important aspect of it. Part of that performance was, you know, how can we implement caching into a site to make sure that everything that we're doing is as fast as possible and as efficient as possible, right? So basically, you see a huge drop after the redesign, and now they have sort of a consistent load. So the super secret technique to a really, really fast site is to remove stuff, get rid of it completely, right? Um, typical, you know, thinking around, you know, when you're a website owner, what you want to do is basically add more features, right? Because that's what our users want. People want bells, people want whistles, so you know, give them feature after feature after feature after feature after feature. Right? Sat on top, you know, add stuff on top of stuff on top of stuff. The problem with that is that you keep adding on more load onto the site, right? And things keep slowing down because you're just adding crap on top of crap. Right? Um, but the best way to actually you know, fix stuff is to actually just get rid of it. Right? Do you actually really need that widget you know, at the bottom of that page then? It takes you know, 200 milliseconds to generate. Do you really need it? Does anyone actually look at it? Does anyone care? No, no. But obviously, that's sometimes not possible. You know, when you're dealing with you know, testy clients that might not understand or appreciate the intricacies of how things work on the internet, you know, it's, it's difficult to fight to, or battle to win, right? So that's where caching is going to help us, right? When we have expensive stuff that we have no other chance to, you know, but to deal with, that's when caching can help. Um, it's more than just for speed. Um, there are cases where caching is going to help you um, prevent your site from going down. There's been instances where you know caching is actually protected sites you know, that rely heavily on the Twitter API, for example. We have some sites that we work with yet that are basically purely powered by tweets. Right? Um, and you know there's been instances where Twitter has gone down, but their site is up because you know they've properly made sure to cache any sort of remote, remote interaction they're doing with the Twitter API. And then caching can actually make you a better developer as well because it actually forces you to think about the code you're writing, right? So that you can write it in a way that can actually be cached, can actually be reused, and can actually be architected in a manner that you know, all the logic and functionality and all that sort of stuff is set right. So, the first thing before you can jump into actually implementing caching into your code is to understand this concept called the cache loop. Right? This is the one of the most common patterns in how you can actually implement and make use of caching. Right? Um, there's other patterns out there, but this is probably the most commonly used one. Right? So there's four simple steps. Right? Step one, get the value we want from the cache. So go to the cache and say, hey cache, do you have this value for me? In our wood analogy and fireplace analogy, it would be us going to the, the, the wood pile that we have and saying, check and see, is there any wood in the wood pile? Right? Step two, was there any wood in the wood pile? If not, that's when we get to step three. So at that point, we go to the forest right? and say, it's chop down some wood. At that point, we bring it back, put it in the wood pile, take some that we need, put the fireplace lid. Right? So that's step four, we actually use the value. Right? In the context of a website, that might be something like, you know, let's say you want to cache uh, a database part, 
So step one would be going to the, the database and saying, or so going to the cache and saying, do you have this query cache? Right? Um, step three, if not, then let's actually go to the database and say, hey database, give me this value that I need. At that point, we go to step four. If you understand things better in code, here's some pseudocode and how you can sort of get a better concept of it. Right? So step one, obviously value get from cache, right? And then we do a conditional check to see was the value found. If it wasn't, generate the value and then store it, right? And at that point, we can do whatever we want. Does that make sense? All right, so there's different types of caching, obviously, at various levels and whatever type of stack you're using, right? Um, there's variable static caching in PHP, right? Um, something I'll talk about, you know, people don't necessarily you know, connect the dots, but like variable, using variables as a type of caching, for sure, right? Um, there's object caching, which will be the majority of my talk. Um, things like, we can do things like fragment caching, you know, red, basically caching render pieces of HTML, um, and things like opcode caching, uh, full page caching, and asset caching. All right, so full page caching is the one that most people are familiar with, right? So if you ever use something like super cache or WP total cache, right, that's where full page caching comes in, right? So the idea is that basically you take the entire generated page, drop it in the cache so that any time another user comes to your site, instead of the WordPress application or your server having to generate things over and over again, right, you go to the cache and say, here you go, right? Basically, it's us, instead of telling WordPress to do the heavy lifting, we basically grab the stuff from cache and give it to the user, right? Um, three most common ones tend to be super cache, WT total cache. There's a few others as well, other plugins that you can use as well. On WordPress.com, we use a plugin that we built in-house called Backcache, right? Um, it's basically a plugin that uses Memcached as a caching backend. Um, and basically, the, the, the really cool thing about it is basically we can serve pages within four milliseconds, right? Um, that's an incredibly fast. Um, and the main, reason has, the main reason for that is that backcache relies purely on memory based caching instead of having to rely on disk based caching, which super cache and WP total cache default to. Total cache, oh, WPTC has options for memory based caching as well, um, if, you are, if you want to check that out. For majority of simple sites, 90% of sites, super cache really you know, fits the bill. If you want something really simple that just no frills you can drop in, sort of work. Super cache is the way to go. WP total cache, if you want more bells and whistles like you know, minification, CDN, all that sort of stuff, that might be something that has to investigate. If you are trying to really go for the you know high scale sites, back cache is probably the one you want to look at. Especially you know, if you, once you start getting to object caching and stuff as well. Um, full page caching is harder to get into now that we're, you know, users want more things like personalization and stuff like that, where you know sites want to be and need to be tailored to individual user experiences, right? So users want like favorite buttons, and users want, you know, especially if you have things like e-commerce and stuff like that. So page caching is becoming a lot harder, right? So it's not as easy to do. Um, that's where things like object caching, which I'll be talking about shortly, come in. Um, one of the most important things to keep in mind is that the quality of your code will impact how effective full page cache is, right? If you're Server requires, like, let's say, five to ten seconds to generate a page. That's going to be really tough on your server, and I'll talk about why a little bit later because of a concept called cache snippets, right? So, you know, if you have, you know, a lot of really slowness in actually generating the pages, that's going to be a problem for your full page cache. Um, yeah, a bit later. All right, opcode caching. Just to quickly gleam on it because I know that a lot of people think that it's important. It actually is. It can actually significantly improve your server level processing times. Right? Um, so things like APC, Xcache, then Optimizer Plus. It basically does things like compiling the PHP, uh, compiling stuff at the PHP level, so that uh, for really large applications, so if you're, you know, if you're a site with you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of files that need to be loaded on every single page load, this will actually help optimize for that. Right? So that's something to look into, um, especially if you're using you know, plugins like Buckethead. <coughs> so jumping straight into caching and code. So variable sentence. If you look at these two bits of code, which one is better? Number one. Hands up. Number two, hands up. Obviously, number two is a clear winner. The main reason for that is that instead of having to do the same function call twice, which we do in number one, we do it once in the second one, assign it to variable, and then just basically reuse it. Right? That's caching. Right? If you look at the cache loop idea, right, that's basically it, it at work. Right? So we assign you know, terms. Basically, the variable is, in, a sense, in essence, our cache. Right? We call the function, assign it to our cache, and we reuse it over, right? <coughs> so their type of caching, you store the value in memory so you can reuse, right? There's another concept that PHP has called a static variable, right? You can assign variables as statics, right? So that you can <coughs> use them 
in the same page load, right? The idea is that that variable um, stays the same within that scope of that function. So if you call the same function over and over again, basically that value will have unchanged, right? So it's helpful if you have a function that's called many times on a page load, right? That requires some sort of expensive process, but the state of that variable will not change that page load, right? Um, so let's say you know you have a, a check that you know checks some sort of you know uh, capability for a user that requires you know jumping through a bunch of different loops, right? But you know for a fact that for that given page load, every, anytime you call that function, it's always going to be the same. That's where static can help, right? So the idea is that basically we define a variable as static, right? Check to see if it's set. If it's not set, you know, uh, we call the function that we want to to generate that value, assign that value, and then return, right? Um, so that the next time you know x is true function is called. Basically, PHP will have remembered the value that we set to that function. So is set, the is set check will fail, and then just basically jump to the return. Right? And then if you can sort of like jump back to the cache loop idea, this is sort of a data play here. Right? So that if is set is us going to the cache and saying, you know, is the cache value set? If it's not, then we call our expensive function to do what we want, and we return. So one thing you might never know is that WordPress has caching built in. Right, so WordPress has what's called basically a non-persistent caching API. Right, so when you install your WordPress, right, you know, just go to WordPress.org, install it. It actually comes with caching. Right, a lot of people, you know, there's discussions in the community around WordPress should come with a caching plugin. No, WordPress should do this, WordPress should do that. But WordPress actually has a caching API built in, and WordPress actually internal is actually use that API extensively. Right, um, and the main reason for that is that on any given page load, you're going to need to do a lot of computations. Right? So that involves things like going to the database, you know, generating different values and things like that. And WordPress tries to optimize for that. Uh, one important <coughs> thing to note is the, the word non-persistent, and I'll come back to that shortly. So here's how WordPress caches options. Right? So one of the first things on any given page what WordPress does is basically fetches auto-load equals yes options. Right? So in the options table, you'll see um, a column called uh, auto-load, and the value will be either yes or no. Um, so what WordPress does is basically does one query, right, to say, give me all the options in the options table that have auto load yes. Right? And auto load just basically is a way to define, you know, these, these, this option should be loaded on any given page load, or, or sorry, one of the first things should be loaded, right? And then what it does is basically takes that result as its object cache, which, you know, basically just really a global array, um, if you don't, uh, uh, by default. So the next time an option is needed, it looks in the cache first. Basically, instead of having to go to the database and say, hey, database, do you have this value for me? It goes to the cache and says, hey, cache, do you have this value for me? Right? And you know, 90% of cases, it will, because WordPress did that on the load equals yes for it, right? and added to the cache. If it's not found, it goes to the database and then updates the array, so it doesn't have to go back to the database again next time. So here's a very trimmed down version, sort of what WordPress does in the get option function. Right? So you know, WordPress calls this WP load all options call. Right. And WP load all options basically just as a query for the auto load equals yes. Right? And it checks to see, well, is the value that we want, so the option, whatever key we specified, is that set? If it is, assign it and the return. If it's not, go to the database and get it. So WordPress by default will cache lots of things for you. Right? So things like options, posts, users, queries, terms, relationships, etc., etc., etc. So there's a lot of stuff under the hood that WordPress is actually doing to actually cache stuff. Um, if you just search for, you know, the WP underscore cache, right, and through the WordPress code base, you'll find hundreds of instances of it. All right, so and the way that WordPress do is, does this is using this WordPress object caching API, right? So it's a very simple API um, that, you know, has sort of centers around four key functions, right? And I'll sort of go over those functions shortly so you can sort of understand how that works, right? So the first function, Uh, so I'll actually talk about this because the scrolling isn't working. So the first function is WP cache get, right? So that's our way to actually interact with the cache to get a value from the cache, right? So there's four uh, two key parameters, right? So the first one is a key, the second one is a group. So a key is basically just a unique identifier for our cache value, right? So it can be anything that we want. Um, there's some limits around how long it can be, but generally the idea is that it should be unique to whatever value that we're still, right? So if we're let's say you know fetching tweets from the Twitter API. Right, and this tweet relates to my account, so Njanga, right? I would use the cache of the key value of Njanga, right? Uh, the second argument is group, which is basically a way to group different sets of values together, right? So in, in our tweet example, 
we might use a group value of tweets. Right? So when when uh, WordPress actually goes to the cache and basically just you know, sends the data to the cache, it'll usually generate a really a long key a key value uh, uh, ID for that cache entry that combines both the key and the group. Um, on multi-site installs, it you know appends the group uh, blog ID as well. So that's a very simple you know way to get values from the cache. Um, to actually set values in the cache, we use WP cache set, right? Um, Four simple ar ar arguments it takes. All right, so again, we have the key value, uh, the key parameter. Right, so whatever unique identifier we want to give to this cache value. The second is the actual data that we want to put in. Now you can put any sort of data that you want. Um, there's some weird intricacies around things like things like simple XML objects can be cached. But for the most part, you can dump anything into this function, and it'll just take it and uh, serialize. The cool thing is that if you actually take like let's say um, an array, you know, pass it as the data. When you call WP cache get, you'll actually get an array return back. So it'll, it's a bit smart about um, maintaining that uh, uh, data type relationship. Uh, third one, again, is a group that I talked about. The fourth one is expire. Right? So you can actually set an expiry time for your cache values. Right? So if, let's say you know, this cache value is only valid for 10 minutes or an hour or a day, you can actually specify that as a one word. Um, and you can specify it in seconds. There's a matching function called add. And I'll touch on the difference between uh, add and set shortly. But you know, same parameters, uh, key, data, group, and then expire. <coughs> There's obviously a delete function as well, which just takes the, the key and the group. So the difference between add and set. So it's very similar to add metadata, uh, add post meta and update post meta, in that add for if you call add and the value already exists, it'll just it'll just skip out. Right? So it won't just bother updating. Whereas with set, if you actually, whatever value you give it, it'll just override it, regardless of if it exists or not. All right, so how can we actually implement this? Set the cache if you know if the tweets are actually done. 
mistake that this makes is that you know, it doesn't account for the fact that Twitter might be down, right? It might not return it. So what will happen is that if Twitter is down all of a sudden, we're only setting the cache if we actually get something back from the Twitter API, which basically means that you know, every single call we're making to fetch these tweets is basically failing, and we're having to do this whole process over and over again. Right? So a better way to handle that is actually you know, when you do have So with the, with the code example there, basically, you know, if the, the fetching of the tweet fails, right, if you do a cache code, so the idea is that our error condition, which is the else, basically we still cache it using an empty array, but cache it with a smaller cache time, right? So when we set the expire to one minute, whereas our successful one, we set it to 10 minutes. So that means that, you know, Twitter, if the Twitter API goes down, our site will still stay up because we're still caching that error condition, so we don't have to continue to go to the Twitter API over and over again, and then you know, have to worry about rate limits and things like that. Um, but in this case, you know, we'll just you know return an empty, you know, so our tweet widget will be broken or whatever. Uh, but you know, for that one minute, our site will stay up, and then you know, when then the, the, the cache time expires, that's when we go back to the Twitter API and check again. And then you can obviously delete 
So in action, pop this over again so you can see it. All right, so again, similar concept, right? Again, catch loop in action, right? So get transient, we fetch, you know, check the value to see if it's in the, the uh, in our transients cache, right? Did we find it? So we do the false check. If it wasn't, you know, make a remote call to whatever we want. You know, JCon DSO, uh, JSON DECO, remote retrieve, et cetera, et cetera. We call set transient to actually set the value and then do whatever we want. So pretty straightforward, similar concepts to the object caching API. All right, so be very careful with transients. You don't want to overuse them, right? They're stored in the options table, right? So if you ever, you know, open up the options table, um, you know, go to one of the, basically look at all the entries that you have, you'll basically see options with underscore transient, underscore blah, 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 blah. Those are basically transients, that, that's basically WordPress's transient cache. So stuff is basically being stored in the options cache, or, or sorry, the options table. And what that basically means is that they require a database calls to fetch. A database call is slightly more efficient, or in most cases more efficient than actually you know, wording or interacting with a remote API, so it's more efficient in that sense. But it still requires work to do, right? So just be careful of it. Um, it can actually cause a bloat as well. I've seen, you know, seen sites go down, and you know, people have no idea why. And the main reason was because they had like, you know, 140,000 entries in the options table just filled the transients because they were caching everything in transients, right? So you want to be very careful about what you use transients for and how much you actually store within these transients. Uh, one thing, uh, I think I skipped something. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that. If you are using an object, a persistent object caching backend like memcaching, transients just become a wrapper for uh, the object cache, right? So it doesn't matter if you call get transient or it doesn't matter if you call it cache get, get transient just sort of translates to WP cache get. And the same thing with all the other functions. So, famous last words. Oh, don't worry, I'll just put it in the cache for transients. That worries me a lot. That's one of the most common excuses I hear from people. Is that oh you know my site's slow I'll just or you know my code is slow don't worry the query is slow oh I'll just wrap it in a cache it'll be fine but that actually causes a lot of problems right um, you need to be smart about what your application is doing this goes back to the idea of the code quality thing that I mentioned right if your code sucks caching will only help you so much right it's you know there's going to be a certain point where you know, everything is going to break down because your code is not optimized right so a slow query will always be a slow query regardless of how many layers of caching. Right? And main, one of the main reasons for this is a concept called cache stampedes. Right? It's basically it's when a loader requests, you know, in succession, kick off the same expensive process. Right? Because all of them happen to hit an empty cache. Right? If we jump to our lumberjack analogy, uh, the fireplace analogy. Right? So imagine if you had, you know, a log cabin with a bunch of people. Right? Let's say all of you sort of, you know, get home to the log cabin one after the other, and after the other. All of you want to set up the fireplace. You go to the cache. <laughs> Right? You realize there's no wood, I'm going to go to the forest, start chopping some trees. Next, your roommate comes in, wants to set up the fireplace, goes to the cache, sees that there's no wood, goes to the forest, starts chopping wood. Roommate after roommate after roommate comes in, wants to set up the fire fireplace, there's no, cache, there's no wood in the cache, goes to the forest. Now you have 10 people basically attempting to chop wood. Right? All because you know there's nothing in the cache. Right? The same thing can happen on really large traffic sites. Right? The idea is that someone comes to your site, you know, has to kick off for an expensive query. Let's say, on average, it takes two seconds, right? Within that two second span, you could have, you know, people have person after person after person after person hitting the site, and all of them basically hit an empty cache because that value that, that was required is still being generated by the first person that hit the, <coughs> hit the page, right? So all of them will now flood to the database and say, hey, database, run this query for me, right? So within that two second span, if you have, you know, a large site like time.com or cnn.com, or if there's breaking news, or if all of a sudden, you know, get a Reddit spike, Things can break because now your database is being overloaded by requests to run this really slow query. Right? At some point, you know, the, the query will finish, right? Someone will go back to the, the cache and, and add it to the cache. And so any request after that will be fine. But within that two second period, right? Serious damage can be done. And I've seen sites go down because, you know, some really slow queries that created these sorts of cache that needs. Right? Um, so there's there's Simple solutions for it. Um, so the very easiest one is basically you know, create some sort of lock process, right? So basically the idea is to prevent a pileup, right? So instead of having ten people all of a sudden flood to the forest, or having ten people go to the database and say, "Hey, database, give me stuff," right? You basically stop them before the, you know stop them at the cache level and say, "Hey, the value isn't 
in the cache, but it is being generated right now, so don't worry about it. It'll come back to you shortly. Right? So in our fireplace analogy, they'll be basically similar to leaving a note and saying, hey, don't worry, I'm out of chopping wood, I'll be back soon. Um, the problem with that is that if you, so for example, if, it's, if you're using that query to generate you know, the main loop on the site, that can basically mean that for some users, you know, they'll get the lock and say, oh, crap, I have nothing, so I'm going to show an error page. But that's better than, you know, all of a sudden, if you having a thousand users overwhelming your database server, um, you can completely bring down the site. The other solution is to basically use uh, an async process, so separate the, the cache generation from the page load, right? So instead of basically user hitting the site and then kicking off the query process, use some sort of async process that's running in the background, um, so whether that's WP cron or some sort of other, you know, cron process or some sort of ongoing thing that is generating the process in the background for you, right? So that's the other solution. But the best solution is just to fix the damn thing, right? Just either it's a slow query, get rid of it, right? Why is it slow? Right? Does it need to be? Does it need to take two seconds, five seconds, ten seconds, right? If it's that slow, that's there's a problem, right, in that code. You need to really rethink why that query needs to, you know, be there first of all, and then why is it that slow? Can you do something or change the architecture of our plugin or our, or our database or our data to actually make it better? Right? Um, one of the important things to sort of look at is the uncached page load idea, right? So how fast does your page load without a cache, right? And you want to optimize that for, for that as much as possible, right? Because if you're over relying on cache, that's a problem, right? Again, you know, if you have you know ten queries that take ten seconds each or two seconds each, right? When you look at the cold cache, right? So every once in a while, some user is going to hit the site with an empty cache, right, in the middle of the night, let's say, and they're going to have to generate all those ten two-second queries, right? And they're going to get a really slow page load, right? So you want to optimize for that as much as possible, right? And the simplest technique for that is basically just to kill, so if you're using something like memcached, kill the cache and see how fast you know, different pages load on your site. So you know, things like the homepage category, single, you know, sort of com complex or special templates that you have, see how they perform without a cache, right? And then once you've optimized as much as possible as, as, as you can, that's when you start to add caching on top of that, right? So once you notice that you've optimized queries as much as possible, or once you've optimized your code as much as possible, and you notice that something is still taking, you know, Bit, a bit of added weight, that's when you can add caching on top of it to make it faster. So, uh, touch on that a bit. So, in summary, basically, caching on WordPress is easy. There's lots of stuff that's sort of built in. There's tons of ways to do it, right? Different levels that you can add caching on top of, right? Object caching is obviously the one that I spent most time on, right? Uh, understand, understanding sort of the intricacies of who, what, when, where to cache is hard. It's completely outside the scope of my talk because that's a huge other discussion, but I'm happy to chat about it if anyone wants to after this talk. Um, there's a lot more to caching, like I said, than I've covered here. Um, and if used well, caching will help you have sites stay, you know, stay alive, stay fast, and make you lots of money. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm happy to answer any questions on caching or something else. Um, uh, how do you simulate uh, a real-world load testing when you try this caching? Uh, it's very hard. <laughs> um, there's, there's, uh, there's obviously tools out there. One of the, one of the, the ones I like most is because of the tool name is Bees with Machine Guns. But basically, you know, try to um, try to just you know simulate, like you said, simulate load using different tools. Um, I would do both in in the sense like you know, the uncached page load. I guess I would do two set two types of tests. Is basically to kill your cache and then do a test to see how your site performs. So let's say you know all of a sudden your uncaching service happened to go down. How would your site perform in that instance? Right. So that you can you know, identify the bottlenecks and parties and stuff that you know, are bad. And then also do a test with your caching in place to see you know, does does caching actually help you know fix those issues that we saw without uh, the caching or does it you know not bother? So if you're having problems with both those tests, that basically means that the underlying problems are larger. I know that, that super cache and the W3 cache does a lot. I would thinking of in the things that we'll be doing, I'll probably just use that. The things that I would like to know, what is each good for? You mentioned something before. For example, for a site that has a lot of photography, that takes a long time to uh, download. So it's downloaded, would any of these plugins be able to differentiate which page takes the most time and let it remain in the cache for a longer time and remove those to a prevent pileup. You know, that's easy load. Does it do that or should should something else be uh, considered? 
Um, so, I mean, that's it's, it's a bit tricky answer because there's two different components, right? So there's a server side component and client side component. For a photography heavy side, you're going to have to worry about both, right? So in some cases, you might have a page that's loading you know, 1,000 photographs, right? Um, so you know, that, that would be slow on the server side, but it's also going to be slow on the client side, right? Um, both, so it's super cache and WC total cache will optimize on the server side, right? So they'll cache those pages. There's some sort of intelligence built in, so like, for example, you know, you can set options that so that the audience won't actually get rid of the cache uh, entry until that page is updated again, right? So you don't have to worry. So you know, once you up update a page, it'll stay in the cache and stay there forever until it's updated, or the cache needs to be updated, right? So that, that helps from that standpoint. Um, on the client side, there's other, you know, Techniques that you can do things like you know uh, asset caching, you know CDN caching, and things like that. Um, so I would look at that and you know things like lazy loading and stuff like that. And there's there's stuff like that built into WP Total Cache to some extent, but it requires you to you know for example connect to a CDN and so on. Hey Mo, uh, really good talk. I have a quick question. Um, uh, one of your examples used WP Cache Add, yeah. while another one of your examples used WP Cache Set. Mm -hmm. uh, those sound very similar. When is there a difference? When should you use one versus the other? Yeah, there was a slide on that. <laughs> basically, the key difference is basically add will basically skip if the value exists in cache. Right. right. Set will. Is there a benefit for performance to use one over the other? Um, if you know for a fact that the, the, the value is not going to be in cache, add is better to use. I know there's some intricacies around remotes. If you have multiple data centers and stuff like that, there's intricacies around that, but I didn't know. Um, yep. You mentioned that uh, the WP cache object can use uh, uh, can become persistent by using something like memcache. Does the API then allow you then to specify whether something is supposed to be persistent or not? Uh, no. So the idea is that you know, if either everything is persistent or everything is. It's one or the other. If you have if you have an object caching back end, it's always going to be persistent. Okay. It wouldn't make sense then. Some things are going to change. You know, you won't then probably want to use them. So, in, in, in that instance, you want to look at probably something like you know the, the PHP level static caching. Like that might be. So, if you know that you know it's going to change between users, uh, that's when you need to use, use unique keys for each user. So, for example, if you're storing a cache value that's unique to each user, right. you would append something like a user ID to that key. I see. Or you know, that, if, if that's not not going to work, then you know use something like you know a static. So basically, all, all the stuff that uh, WordPress uses by default will work if it's persistent as well. Then. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, uh, what are your thoughts on using something like Backcash or or uh, W three or any of the other WordPress caching mechanisms versus using something like Varnish external of WordPress itself? Um, it's. I mean, it won't hurt. Besides, obviously, like if you have like. I know, so on VIP, we sometimes do a mix of both. Right? So we'll have back cache, but also have some sort of Nginx level caching as well. That's obviously going to make your sites extremely, even more faster, right? because you cut out you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the PHP level completely, because you don't have to go to PHP, because the web server can basically intercept the request and just give it to the page. Right? Um, a lot of people use something like Nakamai for that as well. Right? You've had a lot of VIPs, so you don't bloody Akamai, so you use that as sort of like a cache content. So it's not, it's not going to hurt your site. It's going to make things harder if you want to use like the idea mentioned of user personalization and things like that, um, and things like invalidations, right? They come a lot harder because you know with something like super cache or total cache, you can do things like invalidation around. You know, when a user hits update, you can flush the caches for that post or the home page and things like that. Um, you can obviously you know hook in and you know send out invalidation requests, but that obviously adds complexity to it. So if you have a really large scale site and you don't need to worry about personalization at that user level, then it's probably something that's Hi. Um, with the transients API, you might have said this, um, if you have memcached configured or something like that, is it still going to store everything in auctions, or will it use the caching engine you have? Uh, yeah, so it's, if you have a persistent caching backend, it'll just funnel everything through that instead. So get transient. So if you actually look up the the code for get transient does basically a check at the top, the top that says, you know, it's meant to get the, the conditional. So basically just text to see if there is a 
persistent backend just funnels the calls that you can get to the mesh set, etc. Hi, uh, kind of a basic question. If uh, what is the point of non-persistent caching if you're rebuilding it on every page load? So the main reason is basically to avoid repeated database calls, right? So on any given page load, you, let's say you have a theme that you know has to call, or basically stores everything in one option, right? So you know you're storing things like you know the background or you know, just different user strings and stuff like that, right? So it's, if we didn't have any sort of per, uh, caching in play, what would happen is that anytime you call get option. WordPress will have to basically go to the database and say, give me this value. Right? So every time you call get option, go to the database, you'll get the value, go to the database, get the value. Right? Which is basically a waste. Right? We don't necessarily have to do that over and over again. What we can basically do is basically store it um, for that you know, one particular page load session. Right? Session is the wrong word to use it. But sort of get the edge. So for that one particular page load, you know, store those values so that we don't have to do that repeated chirp over and over again.